All right, so welcome to your derivative concepts and review basic worksheet video. I'm just going to go through and do every problem. Um, hopefully you guys are trying some of these on your own and I'm just using the video to fast forward to the things you need help with. Um, but watch as much as you need to. Now, we're not doing the entire worksheet. Hopefully, as you know, we're only doing certain problems. So let's go ahead and start off with the first one that I've assigned to you guys for the week, and that would be number two. Um, so here we go, number two. All right, so it says evaluate each limit. Now, you guys might know how to do this using L'Hopital's rule, but we're not gonna, I'm not going to go that route. You can go that route. If you know how to do L'Hopital's, more power to you, have at it. Um, but I'm going to use the strategy that we learned pertaining to the limit definition of a derivative, because I noticed that I, here I'm not looking at just any old limit. This is a difference quotient. I've got y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 here. Okay, and so I'm I realize this is not just any old limit. This is the limit of a difference quotient, which means that this is actually going to give me the value of the derivative of some function at a specified point. Um, or actually, this is just going to give me the, the value, the, the derivative itself. So the question here then is, first of all, what function are we finding the derivative of? Well, you have to recognize, is this the standard form or the alternative form? Well, as you guys can see, like this is the one with the h in it. That's the standard form. This is the alternative form. And in the alternative form of the limit definition of a derivative, which I'll go ahead and rewrite again here real quick, but it is on your notes from this lesson. The function is right there. And so my function is sine of x. Next, I'm going to ask, what value are we finding the c at? Or what value, are we, what value of c are we plugging in to find the derivative? Okay, well, the c is the number that's right here. So for us, it's 2 pi over 3. So therefore, we could say that f of x is equal to sine of x. That's my function. And then, since this whole thing equals the derivative at a derivative of that function at this point, we could just find the derivative of this function, which is cosine of x, and then plug in the number that they give us to our derivative. And we'll have our answer there. OK, so we have our answer. The answer is negative one half. There you go. That simple. So basically, you need to recognize is this. First of all, you need to recognize that this is a limit definition of a derivative. Second of all, you need to recognize that it's the alternative form. From there, you can find what function it is and what point we're doing. So that way, fourth of all, you can actually find the derivative. And that's what that limit would equal. However, like I said, if you're comfortable with and know L'Hopital's rule, it will work. So you could do that, and you should end up getting the same answer. All right, let's go ahead and do the other one that I've assigned. Uh, I've assigned to you guys number three. Now, you'll notice that on number three, this is not the, um, the alternative form. This is the standard form. Standard form looks like this. Okay, standard form looks like that. This was a little bit harder to figure out what's going on. Okay, um, in this case, they're plugging a number in as well for x. So the number they're choosing to plug in for x, I'm going to go ahead and put that here now. So let me let me go ahead and plug that in. You'll notice that. Where I had the x, they have a 2 thirds, right? So I know that that's my x. Well, actually, what that is is that's my c value. So 
We're going to answer the same questions. First of all, we need to know what's my function. And I also need to know what's my c value. Well, we just found the c value. It's, it's the number you're plugging in. The number you're plugging in for x. Now, if you want to know what your function is on this one, you have to do two things. You have to cross off the h and replace the number with x. Okay, so let me show you what I mean by that. I'm going to cross off the h and replace this with x. If I do that, that gives me f of x, right? Now let's do that over here on this thing. So if I cross off the h and replace this with a big x, I end up with x to the fifth. There's my function. So my function is x to the fifth power. Now we're ready for that third step, which is where, OK, so since I'm finding the limit of a difference quotient, that's going to give me the derivative of this function at the value of 2 thirds. So here's my function. I'm going to find its derivative and plug in 2 thirds. So my function is x to the fifth. The derivative is 5x to the fourth. So I'm now going to plug in the 2 thirds. Got to remember your order of operations. You do your power first. That would give you 16 over 81. And that would give me 80 over 81 after you multiply by 5. And so there you go. So this limit here results in the outcome of 80 over 81. All right. Now, L'Hopital is not going to help you on this one because there's no x in this problem. For this one, L'Hopital will work because you can find uh, the derivative of that. If you tried to do L'Hopital on this one, technically you would just end up with 0. So on this one, you actually do need to recognize, OK, first of all, I'm looking at the limit definition of a derivative. Second of all, it's a standard form. Therefore, I need to know how to find my function and my c so I can take the derivative and find the answer. Okay, So that's numbers 2 and 3, limit definitions of derivatives. Let's go ahead and move on to our next question. On this one, I only signed one of these to you. All right, so I assigned you guys to do this one. The question is saying, determine if this piecewise function is continuous and if it's differentiable at that particular value of x. OK, so x equals negative 2. All right, well, if you want to know if a piecewise function is continuous, we need to check on a couple of things. First of all, we need to make sure that the function exists at that point. Second of all, we need to find the limit from the right of that point. And then we also need to find the limit from the left of that point. If all three of those things are equal, then that means this function is continuous. Because if these two are equal, that means the limit exists. And if this equals that, then the function has to be continuous because the definition of continuity is that this is equal to its limit. So we just need to find all three of these things and determine if they're all equal. So let's go ahead and do that first. So f of negative 2. Well, negative 2. The function can equal negative 2 for this piece right here. So I'm going to be plugging that in. 1 fourth of negative 2 squared minus 1. Now I can simplify that real quick. That's going to be negative 1 minus 1, which is negative 2. All right, next one. Now I want to approach f of x from the right of negative 2. Now what that means is, is I'm looking for where x is greater than negative 2, not equal to, greater than negative 2. Where is x greater than negative 2? Well, that's this same piece. This is saying that x is greater than negative 2. So it's actually going to end up being the same thing. And so, yeah, these are definitely going to come out equal because they're literally the same equation. Well, let's do the last one. For this one, that means I'm looking for where x is less than negative 2, and that's right here. So for that one, I'm going to use this piece. 
Now, if I plug in negative 2 there, I just get negative 2. And as you guys can see, all three of those are equal. Therefore, f is continuous at x equals negative 2. You guys are like, oh my gosh, I kind of remember that stuff. Hopefully. <laughs> all right. Now they want to know, is it differentiable? Is it differentiable? That's, a, that's an interesting question. So let's, let's go ahead and see. So first of all, what you're going to want to do for this question is find the derivative. And the way that you find the derivative of a piecewise function is simply by taking the derivative of all the pieces. So the derivative of this piece up here is negative 1. The derivative of this piece is 1. The derivative of this piece would be negative 1 half x. And the derivative of this ugly looking thing here, that's going to have to be, well, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. And then we've got to take the derivative of the inside, because it's a chain rule, which means I'm going to multiply the outside by pi over 4. And of course, we still have this. That's a constant multiple, so that just stays there. And in this case, the, these two things actually just completely cancel each other out. And so I'm left with nothing at all there. All right, so there's my derivative. Now, all of these are going to stay almost the same, but you'll notice a little difference. See if you can identify the little difference that I'm making here. If you haven't noticed it yet, the little difference is, is that I didn't put any equal signs, and that's on purpose. Because it's possible that at these points that we have here, 4, I'm sorry, negative 4, negative 2, and positive 2, it's possible that at those points there's a cusp. And if there's a cusp, the derivative doesn't exist. And if the derivative doesn't exist, well, that means that you wouldn't put x can equal that. So sometimes we take the derivative, you don't want to put the equal sign. Now, I'm not, there's ways that we could tell whether the equal sign goes there or not, and I'll show you in a minute. But for now, let's continue with our problem. So we've determined that it's continuous, but now I want to know is it differentiable? Well, you really only need to check one thing in order for this thing to come out to be differentiable. Um, you, you do the same exact thing, um, but you don't do the, we'll, we'll skip the one where it's f of whatever. We're just going to focus strictly on the left-handed limit of the derivative and the right-handed limit of the derivative. If the limit of your derivative from the left and from the right are the same, well, then that means you have the same slope from the left and right, and that means your function's differentiable. So let's do that. So once again, if I'm approaching negative 2 from the left, that means I'm looking for where x is less than negative 2. And I think that, where was negative 2? I think that was this one right here. So that's 1. So as I approach negative 2 from the left, my slope is 1. How about as I approach negative 2 from the right? That, that's where x is greater than negative 2. And that's right here. In that case, I have negative 1 half times x, and the x I'm plugging in is negative 2. So in that case, I get 1 again. They're equal. So since the slope from the left and the right is the same, therefore, it's differentiable. Because the derivative exists at that point. So this function is continuous and differentiable at that point. Now, Back to, you don't have to do this for this problem, but I just want to point out that since the limit from the left and the right are the same, that means the derivative exists at negative 2. And if the derivative exists at negative 2, then we can keep the little equal sign that was there. And you could do the same thing for all the other points that are up there, negative 4 and positive 2, but we don't need to. That's not really part of the problem, so we'll just leave that off. All right, so that takes care of that one. Let's go ahead and move on to our next question. Here's a pretty common question on the AP exam. It's one where they give you a piecewise function, and they ask you to find the letters A and B. 
so that you end up with either a continuous function or a function that's differentiable. Now, just so you know, even if they don't put continuous, but they do say differentiable, you still have to make sure it's continuous because the function can't be differentiable unless it is continuous. But if they just say it's continuous, then you don't have to do as much work because you don't have to check the derivative in that case. Remember, if a function is continuous, that doesn't mean it's differentiable. But if it's differentiable, it has to be continuous. All right, so let's go ahead and begin here. So the way that we're going to handle this problem is that if this function is truly continuous, then that would mean that the limit of this function as x approaches this conjoining point here from the right should be equal to the limit as x approaches that conjoining point from the left. Now you might be wondering, are we going to do this one? And the answer is no, you don't really need to on these types of problems. You could, but it's actually not going to help our task, so I just leave it off. You have to do it for the last one because there they're asking, is it continuous? But in this case, we're forcing it to be continuous. And if you write this, that's actually enough to get you there. So I need to make sure that the function has the same limit from the left and right of that conjoining point. And so what that means is, is I need to find the limit as x approaches 2 from the right. Now, if I'm approaching 2 from the right, that's where x is greater than 2, and that's right here. So that would be this piece. Now for the next one, if I'm approaching 2 from the left, that means that x is less than 2, and that would be this piece up here. So let's go ahead and plug in the 2's. You're going to plug those in for x. So if we do that, I'm going to get 2 times 2, which is 4, minus 3 is 1, and the square root of 1 is 1, and 1 times a is a. So that's just going to come out to be a plus, and then when you put the 2 in here, you get 2b. Now on this side over here, I'm going to go ahead and plug in 2. 2 squared is 4. 4 take away 3 is 1. And ln of 1 is 0. All right, fair enough. Let's hold on to that. So in order for this function to be continuous, the a and the b have to work out in such a way that a plus 2b makes 0. So I'm going to hold on to that. Now, I need to make sure that it's also differentiable. So, for it to be differentiable, we're going to repeat this process now, but we're going to do it with the derivative. And this is where your skills with derivatives are going to come in kind of handy, hopefully. All right, so how do you find the derivative of ln? Well, you're going to do blank over whatever's inside, and the blank is going to be whatever that derivative on top of the inside is, which is 2x. So there's the derivative of the top function. Now for the next one, this is a is just a constant multiple, so it's going to stay there. But how do you find the derivative of a square root? Well, there's a little shortcut function that we learned earlier this year. Anytime you have a square root and you want to find its derivative, the rule is basically this simple. You're just going to do 1 over 2 times the square root. Now, if there's something on the inside, you'll also have to multiply it by the derivative of the inside, which usually is just going to put it on the top, therefore. Okay, so let, let's do that. So I'm going to have 1 over 2 times that square root multiplied by the derivative of the inside, which is 2, and that's just going to end up on top. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and just put the a on top with the 2, because that's what you would get. So there's that derivative. And now we're going to repeat that this process that we did here, but we're going to do it with this derivative function. So here we go. What is the limit as x approaches 2 from the right of the derivative? And what is the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of the derivative? And we want to force those things to be equal. So here we go. If I'm approaching 2 from the right, then that's going to be this piece here. Oh, and you know what, you guys, I forgot. When I was doing my derivative, um, 
when you take the derivative of that, I just found the derivative of this, but I forgot about my bx. The derivative of bx, that's, the b is like a number. So like, think about what's the derivative of 3x? Well, it's 3. So the derivative of bx is going to be b. So I forgot to put my b here, my bad. So I need to put that in there right now. All right, now let's do the other one here. What's the limit of my derivative x approaches 2 from the left? If I'm approaching 2 from the left, that would be this one. And that's going to be 2x over x squared minus 3. And now what we're going to do is we're going to plug the 2 in for the x values. All right, so that's going to give me 2a over, now if I plug in 2, 2 times 2 is 4. 4 take away 3 is 1, and the square root of 1 is 1. So I have 2a over 1, which is really just 2a. So after plugging in 2, I just end up with 2a plus b. Now for the next one, if I plug in 2, I'm going to get 4. 4 minus 3 is 1. So I end up with a 1 in the denominator. And then I'm going to plug in 2 on the top also. So I've got 4 over 1, which is 4. And now I've got this. So now, in order for my function to be continuous, a plus 2b has to be 0. But in order for it to be differentiable, 2a plus b has to equal 4. Now what we have in this case is called a system of equations. And so you have to kind of go back to algebra 1 and 2 and remember how to solve a system of equations. And by the way, if, if they ever ask you a question like this, and they just want to say, is it continuous? Then you only have to do this first equation. And when you're there, you, you will actually be able to solve it right away. But if they're asking for differentiability, a lot of times you have to create two equations like I've done. And then you have to do a system of equations to solve it. And I kind of erased it, so I guess I'll rewrite it real quick. And then I'm going to put this other one right on top of it here. Now, you could use the substitution method or the elimination method. I think I'm going to go ahead and go with the substitution method. I think a lot of you guys are a little bit more comfortable with that. So the way the substitution method works is you pick an equation, and you get a variable by itself. So I'm going to get a by itself. My advice when you're doing this, by the way, is to get one by itself in such a way that you don't end up with fractions anywhere if you can help it. Like you, on this equation, you wouldn't want to get the b by itself because you'd end up with fractions. And where there's fractions, there's sadness. So instead of using this equation, then I'm going to use the rewritten form, which is this. So get the equation by itself. After you get the equation by itself, since a equals negative 2b, I can plug that into the equation underneath of it. So that would look like this. And that gives me negative 4b plus b, which gives me negative 3b, which gives me b equals negative 4 thirds. So I've got b. Now we need to find a. And the way you find a is just by plugging it into one of these equations. The one I would suggest is the one where a is already by itself. So a is equal to negative 2 times b. And we just found out that b is negative 4 thirds. So the negatives are going to cancel. And when you multiply that by 2, you're going to end up with 8 thirds. So there's my two values of a and b that will make this function both continuous and differentiable. All right. Let's go ahead and move along to the next question here. For this particular problem, we're going to be doing a, b, and d. And what they want me to do is they want me to determine if the function is continuous and if it's differentiable and to give a reason. All right, so let's start off with negative 4. Here's my point, negative 4. Now you'll notice there's no holes, gaps, or jumps at that point. Okay, so we're going to say, okay, that means it's continuous at x equals negative 4 since f of negative 4 is equal to the limit as x approaches negative 4. 
Now you could test this to make sure of it, right? Find this. What's f of negative 4? That would be negative 4, the y value. And find the limit. Well, the limit is what y value are you approaching from the left and from the right? Well, the y value that I'm approaching is the dot that exists there. And so that's continuous. There's no holes, gaps, or jumps. So since the value of the function is equal to the limit of the function at that point, we would say it's continuous. This is how you would explain it. Okay? On an FRQ, that's important. Now, is it differentiable? Let's see. So differentiability, we've learned already that you can't have a cusp. And that's right where the cusp is. So we're going to say not differentiable. And the reason it's not differentiable is because the slope from the left is not the same as the slope from the right. And the way you write that would be, you would say it's not differentiable since the limit as x approaches negative 4 from the right, I'm sorry, from the left, is not equal to the limit as x approaches negative 4 from the right of the derivative. Notice these have little derivatives here because we're talking about the slope at that point. So that one is continuous because it, there's no holes, gaps, or jumps, and this is how you would write that. But it's not differentiable because the slope from the left and the right is not the same, and that's how you'd write that. Let's go ahead and do the next one, part B, negative 2. At negative 2, we're right here. Now, that's a hole, right? So that means it's not continuous. And the reason for that is because the limit exists. The limit at that hole is the same from the right and left. Whether you're approaching from the right or from the left, we're reaching that same spot, which is a y value of negative 2. So the limit does exist. But the problem is the function doesn't exist. So we would say, since f of negative 2 does not exist. How about is it differentiable? Well, the answer is no. Why not? As you guys might recall from the notes that we took on this, a function has to be continuous in order for it to be differentiable. So it's not differentiable since it's not continuous. I should specify it's not differentiable at x equals negative 2 since it's not continuous at x equals negative 2. Okay, so that's how you would explain that. All right, let's do one more. We're going to do part D now. We're going to do positive 2. Now, as you guys can see here, we have a jump at this point. Well, that means it's not continuous. Why? Well, the function does exist. That's what that closed dot is. f of 2 is equal to negative 2. But the limit, as x approaches 2 from the left, that would be coming from this side, is also negative 2, so that's nice. Those are equal. Yay! But we also need to make sure that the limit from the right is the same. Now, as I'm approaching from the right, though, I'm approaching this open dot, which is a value of 1, and that's not equal. Therefore, it's not continuous at x equals 2. And once again, if it's not continuous, it's not differentiable either. Why? That's positive 2, sorry. Since f is not continuous at that point. All right. Moving along. We're going to do some related rate questions. So this would be a good time to get out your derivative concepts and review notes um, and follow the steps with me as we go ahead and complete these problems. So let's go ahead and start off with number 16. A spherical snowball is rolled in fresh snow, causing it to grow so that its radius increases at a rate of 3 inches per second. How fast is the volume of the snow increasing when the radius is 3 inches? So 
Anytime you're doing a geometry question with related rates, you're going to want to start off with step one, which is to draw a picture. So what we're dealing with here, we're talking about a spherical snowball, and snowballs have a radius. And since this snowball is rolling, it's growing. It's becoming bigger and bigger as it rolls down the hill, just like you've seen in the cartoons. Um, and so since it's a changing radius, I'm going to put R. Now, anytime we draw a picture, if there's a value that's not changing, it's always the same, just put a number there. But if it's a changing value, put a variable there. And that's about the best we could do there, is with that picture. All right, step two, you want to identify the given rate. And as you do it, you want to put the units that go with it. Well, here's the rate right here. It says that the, rate, the radius is increasing at 3 inches per second. So how do we write this? Well, it's always going to be d blank over dt. And the blank is whatever you're dealing with. In this case, I'm dealing with the radius. So I'm going to put r there for radius. So dr dt means the rate of change of radius with respect to time. That's the rate of change of the radius over time. And what it is is it's equal to 3. Now, something at this step you've got to pay attention to is whether this is a positive or a negative rate, because the word problem will hint at it, but it won't tell you whether it's positive or negative directly. In this case, since it's an increasing rate, that would mean it's a positive rate. If they told you it was decreasing, well, I'm sorry, since the radius is increasing, it's a positive rate of change. If they ever told you something was decreasing, then that would suggest that your rate is negative. All right, step three is to identify the rate you're trying to find. Well, what they're asking us is asking us to determine the rate at which, or how fast, the volume of the snowball is increasing. So that would be dv dt, the rate of change of the volume. Now, volume is not in inches per second. Volume is measured in cubic inches per second. So you've got to get your units right. And I'm just going to put a question mark there because that's what we're trying to find. That's our goal. All right. Step four is you want to find an equation that connects this variable to this variable. Can you guys think of an equation that connects the radius of a sphere to its volume? Well, you might not be able to, but just so you guys know, on the AP test, they usually just tell you that formula. I'll tell you what it is here. Um, the formula is V equals pi, I'm sorry, it's actually 4 over 3 pi r cubed. So step four is to find a formula that connects the two variables that you care about. In this case, it's the V and the R. Step five is to take the derivative of that formula with respect to time. So that would give me dv dt. And for this one, we're going to apply the power rule. So I'm going to multiply this 3 times the 4 thirds, which is going to leave me with 4. The pi stays because it's a constant. And then r is going to be to the second power now because you take 1 away from the power after the derivative. But you've got to remember, this is implicit differentiation. So since this variable doesn't match this variable, you do need to multiply it by a dr dt. Or in other words, an r prime. But we're going to write it as dr dt. All right? Step 6, plug and solve. Sometimes this is okay and not too bad. Sometimes it's a little bit tough. It's tough whenever they don't give you everything you need right up front. It's easy when they do. So let's see. Well, obviously we don't have dv dt because that's what I'm trying to find anyway, right? That's my goal, so we wouldn't expect to have that. But do we have these other two things? I need a radius and I need a dr dt. Well, let's see. They gave me a radius right here. It's three when the radius is 3. So yay, they gave me that. Do I have a dr dt? Sure enough, they gave me that too. That's also 3. So let's go ahead and simplify this. This is 9 times 3 is 27 times 4. Hmm, 80 plus 20, 108, and then pi. So 108 pi. And you don't want to forget your units. It was cubic inches per second. I've reached my goal. I found the rate of change that I was interested in. And that's how you do a related rate question. We'll do one more.
The next one maybe will be a little bit trickier. Uh, we're going to do number 20. Okay, so a 10-foot ladder is leaning against a wall and it's sliding towards the floor. The foot of the ladder is sliding away from the base of the wall at a rate of three feet per second. How fast is the top of the ladder sliding down the wall when the top of the ladder is six feet from the ground? All right, so we have a ladder leaning up against a wall, and then here's the ground. Now they tell me that this ladder is 10 feet long. Now I'm going to put a number there because that's never going to change. Even though this ladder is sliding down the wall, the, the ladder is going to stay 10 feet long, so I'm going to put a number there. But we do have some changing values here. We have the fact that the, the height of the ladder up the wall is going to be changing because it's sliding downwards. And we also have the fact that the base of the ladder from the wall, that distance is actually going to be increasing because it's sliding away from the wall. So we have those two things changing. So I'm going to put letters there instead. All right, so let's go ahead. That's step one. Let's move on to step two, which is where you identify the given rate. So they're telling me that the base of the ladder is moving away from the wall at a rate of three feet per second. So the letter I chose for that is B. So I'm going to call that DB DT. And since this one's increasing because it's sliding away from the wall, it's going to be a positive three feet per second. Now they're asking me to find what rate? They're asking how fast is the top of the ladder sliding down the wall. So they want to know what's dA dt. We would expect that to come out negative because that one's decreasing, right? But it's still going to be feet per second because they're both just length over time. So we don't know, but that's our goal. Step four. Can you guys think of an equation that relates A and B? Well, I can if you throw 10 into the picture. It's the Pythagorean theorem. which if we simplify it would look like this. Now, let's go ahead and move on to number five. We want to find the derivative of this with respect to time. So, the derivative of this is going to be 2a, but don't forget, since it's implicit differentiation, we need to multiply it by dA dt. Plus, same thing here, 2b db dt. And this is a constant, so it just becomes 0. <coughs> All right, now we're ready to move on to step 6. On step 6, we're just going to start plugging in everything that we possibly can. Do I know the value of a? Let's read it. Um, it tells me here that the top of the ladder is 6 feet away from the ground at, at the point that we care about. So at this point in time that we're actually looking at, it's 6. So I know what a is. I don't know what dA dt is, but that's okay. Because, as you guys can see, that's my goal. I would, I would expect to not know that one. All right, let's take a look for b. Do I have b? Do they tell me how far away the bottom of the ladder is? Well, I'm looking in the word problem, and we're out of numbers. There's no more numbers there. So, unfortunately, we don't have that yet. So we've got to find it. Do I have db dt? I do. That's right here. Thankfully, that one's there. So sometimes you have some missing stuff. And nine times out of ten, if you're missing something, what you're going to do is you're going to come back to this equation, and that's going to help you find it. So if a squared plus b squared equals 100, and a equals 6, well, guess what? We can find b. by just solving the equation. And we find out that b equals 8. So that's an example of a little bit of a harder question because you have to find stuff that you don't have already. After you plug in everything that you want to find, I guess I should have put 6 down here because this is number 6. After you plug in everything that you want to find, you go ahead and start simplifying. So I've got 12 dA dt plus, that's going to be 48, equals 0. 
So I'm going to minus the 48 on both sides, which gives me this. And then I'm going to divide both sides by 12, which will give me negative 4. And my units are feet per second. And that's how fast the ladder is sliding down the wall, 4 feet per second. All right? And so there's that. Now, the other video for the other half of this basic uh, review worksheet is um, uh, it's, it's uh, the study guide from Unit 5, and I've already made that video. So once again, just fast forward to the parts that you want to see if you need to see it. All right? So until then, we'll see you guys later.